Please take your seats. Morning, everyone. Welcome on this holiday weekend. Nice to see you here with us this morning. And welcome to those who are joining us online from wherever you are in the world. It's a beautiful morning here in Motherwell in Scotland. We hope it lasts. Um, The news items are all on the sheet and we're on the screens as you were arriving this morning. But just a couple of things to highlight. Uh, First of all, thank you to those who gave to the harvest offering in favor of Tear Fund last week. You'll see that the offering, the retiral offering, was up by over £100 this year. So that was really splendid. We had a lovely time with all ages in the church last Sunday. Um, Great fun playing countdown together. And uh, I was speaking to Margaret Anderson this morning, and Margaret was telling me that she got that seven-letter word, but she'd put her hand up and I couldn't see her. So stop hiding your light under a bushel, Margaret. Did Chris get it as well? Oh, for goodness sake. You know, you'd given me a showing up. So, well, thank you to those who contributed. If you didn't get one of these envelopes last week and you'd still like to contribute to Tear Fund, there are still some left at the front and the rear doors as well. At the front and rear doors as well, there's a, a prayer for harvest, which Christine Scott has put together. Um, She apologized to me this morning. I don't know why. She said it's a week late, but you know, you can celebrate the harvest at any time, can't you? So there's a wee laminated prayer at both the front and the rear doors if you'd like to take one of those. I can a harvest of a different type just to remind you that our community breakfast is next Saturday morning. And so if you'd like to come along to that, you'd be made very welcome. Some people come because they enjoy having breakfast together but a lot of folk just come for the company. Um, So that's on next Saturday morning through in the hall. And then finally, something that's not in the sheet, but we're absolutely delighted about, is congratulations to Scott and Leslie Angus, who welcomed their third child, uh, a wee baby girl, Hannah, on Wednesday during the course of the week there. So a wee sister for Ewan and for Jessica. And congratulations to grandparents, to Derek and Elizabeth, and to Etta, wherever you are, Etta, great granny as well. Uh, fantastic news. She's absolutely gorgeous. But then have you ever seen a newborn baby that's no gorgeous? But this one's particularly gorgeous. Isn't that right, Derek? <laughs> so congratulations to Scott and Leslie. Wonderful news. Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Let's bring our worship with all of our being to God as we sing our opening hymn this morning. It'll appear on the screens in just a moment. This is a lovely, kind of quiet, reflective, thoughtful piece written a few years ago now by the Scottish hymn writer Ian White. Focus my eyes on you, O Lord.
Let's come together and share in prayer. Let's pray. Living God, we have come together to this place today to worship you and to meet here with the living and risen Lord Jesus Christ. We've come not simply because we feel that we ought to, nor because it's expected of us, but because we actually want to praise you. We want to bring you the worship that you alone are due. We've come not just to share in fellowship, though that's important to meet with one another, nor just to gather with friends, but to encounter you, to know that you are at the heart of all we do. Help us, Heavenly Father, to bring you our heartfelt worship, to reflect on you and to take our eyes off ourselves for a time, to think about your love rather than the problems that loom large for us, to seek your will rather than to focus on our expectations of you. Help us, our God, to draw close to you, to rejoice in your presence, to receive your love, and to have our faith revived. May we put aside everything that comes between us, our foolish actions, the triviality of our concerns, our selfish desires. Lord, there is so much in our lives that is not as it should be, not as it could be, not even as it would be, if only we walked more closely with you. Forgive us the unkind words, the thoughtless deeds, the unworthy thoughts, which threaten to deny or obscure our faith in Christ. Forgive us the self-centered lifestyles, the half-hearted commitment, the careless discipleship that can sometimes undermine our witness. Forgive us our lack of devotion, of faith, of love that demean your name. Living God, we gather together in the name of Christ and as we do, we pray that you will assure us of your forgiveness, of the promise of your guidance, and of your acceptance in a loving way, and that you will give to us that abundant life which Jesus promised. And so may we worship you today, not just through our words, but in the way that we live our lives, not merely now in this moment of heightened awareness, but every day. And not just simply here in the safety and beauty and simplicity of this sanctuary, but everywhere we go, in every part of our being, body, mind, and soul, may we bring glory to your name now and always. Amen. Uh, let's sing together again, Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways.
I was reading an article yesterday on the importance of Sabbath. Sabbatarianism is something that you would have thought has gone out of fashion to look at the world in which we live, because um, this generation has been called the always-on generation. They've either got a smartphone in their hand, or a tablet, or a computer, or they're watching a television program, some of the downloads that they have and all the rest of it. And I include myself in that because life can be kind of busy and can be hectic and can be rushed at times. And I was reminded by that article I read yesterday that sometimes we all need to slow down. That Sabbath was given not just to worship God, but also given for our benefit physically and spiritually so that we could rest. So whether your Sabbath's on a Sunday or a Saturday, Saturday tends to be for me, or another time in the week, we all need a time to slow down and rest and listen for the voice of God. And that hymn that we've just sung by John Greenleaf Whittier um, sums up for me Sabbath quite well. That kind of quietness where you just relax and just be. You don't need to do anything. You just need to be who God created you to be and Sometimes it's when we do that that we sense His presence most closely. Leading into a reading for this morning, that's certainly true of the story that we read today. Our Bible reading is found in 1 Samuel in chapter 3. It speaks about um, a young boy called Samuel in the temple, and it's really a lovely, lovely tender story. Let's hear God's words together. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli again and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli, said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Amen. And we thank God for this reading. Here you go, Samuel. You didn't know your name was going to be mentioned so many times in the Bible reading this morning, did you? Let's sing another hymn. Lord, speak to me, that I may speak in living echoes of your tone. Just as God spoke to Samuel, a young boy in the temple, in the story this morning, So we want him to speak to us, and that's our prayer as we sing this hymn together.
Father, as you spoke to Samuel in the story that we are going to think about now, we pray that you will speak to us. We know that you are a God of creativity and imagination, that there is nothing that is too difficult for you. And so, break through sometimes the barriers that we raise through our busyness, our focus on other things, and speak right into our hearts and spirits today, we pray. And help us to become people who are open to listen for your voice and to follow where you lead us, not just today, but all our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've always thought that the story of Samuel is a very beautiful one. I can remember reading it quite early on when I came to faith. I was kind of trying to find my way through the Bible in different aspects of it and find out about the different stories that, sadly, for me, I missed out on uh, because I wasn't in Sunday school for as long as I perhaps should have been. I think the story of Samuel, as you'll discover, gives hope on just about every level there possibly is. It starts, as some of you will know, in chapter 1 with a situation where there's a man called Elkanah, and Elkanah has two wives, Peninnah and Hannah. A wee bit of a God incidence there because I had intended to speak about this passage and about this story of Samuel long before I knew that Leslie Angus was going to name her third child Hannah. Uh, It's a very beautiful name. The name Hannah means the the grace of God or the favor of God. But Hannah in the story of 1 Samuel would be someone whom I would guess would feel that the grace and the favor of God was not upon because Hannah is described in chapter 1 as being barren. And in those days, that was uh, a great shame to a woman not to be able to to bear her husband any children. But in spite of that, she remained Elkanah's favorite of his two wives. And she was absolutely desperate to have a child. Now, there are some folk in this congregation, and there will be other people who will be listening to this message online, either just now or at some time in the future, and they know what that feels like. They know how desperate uh, they are to have a child, and of course, some people never are able to realize that ambition, Um, and it's quite sad for them. Others realize it in other ways. They either foster children, or they adopt children, or they simply get involved maybe in youth groups and encouraging children and young people. But what Hannah did in response to her barrenness in chapter 1, we learn, is that she prayed. Each time she went to the temple with Elkanah to make a sacrifice of worship, she prayed. And I'd really like you sometime to read, if you haven't done at any point in your life, or even if you have done, just to go back and read chapters 1 and 2. It was too long for me to read those in introduction today, but there's a beauty and there's an intensity and there's a passion about chapters 1 and 2 of First Samuel. We find Hannah there praying about her situation, about the fact that she's unable to bear a child, and she prays so passionately, so deeply, that Eli, who is the priest who was mentioned in this morning's reading, comes and accuses her of being drunk. Now, there's pause for thought. When was the last time that you were in a situation of such great need in your own life that you prayed so passionately that somebody would have accused you of being drunk? Well, as you get into chapter 2, we discover that Hannah makes a breakthrough. And chapter 2 is largely dedicated in the first part to Hannah's prayer of thanks to God because 
Uh, she falls pregnant, and she subsequently gives birth to this wee boy whom she calls Samuel. But chapter 2 is an interesting contrast when you read it, because the first part is all about Hannah's prayer and how grateful she is to God that He has worked a mighty miracle in her life to bring this child to pass. And she's committing, she's dedicating this child, Samuel, in God's service and promises that when he's of age that she'll take him to the temple and that he will serve God there. It's in stark contrast to the latter part of chapter 2, which speaks about the wickedness of Eli's sons, Phinehas and Hophni. Eli was the priest, and his sons were supposed to follow um, his example and take up that priestly role, but sadly Phinehas and Hophni were literally caught with their hands in the till of the offerings of God's people. In fact, chapter 2 in the NIV describes the sons of Eli as being scoundrels. They were utterly wicked. They were only in ministry or priesthood for what they could get out of it themselves. But of course, then we have this beautiful uh, passage that we get to in chapter 3, We're in around the time of 1,000 B.C., folks, so about 1,000 years before Christ was born at Bethlehem. All of this that we read in chapter 3 this morning is happening. And Samuel, we think, was around age of 12 at this time, so he was still quite a young boy. He was serving in the temple. He was assisting Eli the priest. And the opening verses of chapter 3 really are quite stark. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare, it says. There were not many visions. So people were not used to hearing from God, encountering God, engaging with God in any way at all. God seemed very distant from people's everyday experience at this point in Israel's history. It says of Eli that his eyes were becoming so weak he could barely see and that he was lying down in his usual place. And actually in this chapter we've got an amazing contrast because we've got this young boy, Samuel, who starts to hear the voice of God, but doesn't realize it. And we've got this elderly priest, Eli, who is self-satisfied, who is stuck in the mud, and whose eyesight disappearing almost becomes a visual aid of what his spiritual life is like. He can't physically see, but also his spiritual sight has become limited. He's lost sight of that calling that he had from God in earlier years to serve as a priest. But although Eli was struggling with his sight, and although he was limited spiritually, Eli actually became something of a mentor for this young boy, Samuel. He watered the seed that God was planting in Samuel's life. Samuel heard his name called during the night three times. He thought it was Eli who was calling him, and he went to Eli, and he said, you've called me. And Eli said, no, I didn't call you. And Eli's spiritual sensitivity is so dull at that time that even he doesn't realize that it's God who's calling to Samuel. Until the third time, and then Eli kind of wakes up spiritually, and he says to the boy, go and lie down, and if the voice calls to you again, then be open to what that voice is saying. So, even although Eli was actually 
somebody who was becoming spiritually desensitized, he could still operate as a mentor to young Samuel and help him to start to learn to hear from God. A God who was persistent, a God who was patient, and a God who had a purpose for this young boy, Samuel. God is persistent with us too. God is very patient with us, and God has a purpose for us. If we think that this story is just a story for a time in the past when, you know, God directly spoke to people, then we'd be very wrong, because God, in His Word, again and again shows that He wants to engage with us. He wants to meet with us. He wants us to be aware that He is alive, and He wants to guide our lives in the same way as he ended up guiding Samuel's life to become probably the greatest of the prophets, certainly one of them, in Israel. But one of the interesting things for me about this particular passage is what it says in verse 7. Samuel did not yet know the Lord, The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Samuel was living at the temple. He was worshiping God, and he was serving God. And yet, it says of him, he did not yet know God. What does that mean? Seems like a strange thing to say. He was living in God's house. He was assisting the priest. And yet, it says, he did not yet know God. What it means is he didn't know God in that intimate way. He didn't know God in that personal way. He wasn't looking for God to engage with him in a very personal way. And that's why he didn't recognize his voice. But when he went and lay down the fourth time, eventually, He was open to the thought that the voice speaking to him was not the voice of the priest, but the voice of God himself. A.W. Tozer is probably one of the foremost Christian writers of his generation. He wrote and published a book in 1948, 70 years ago now, which was entitled The Pursuit of God. Here's a quote from that book. Tozer writes, I venture to suggest that the one vital quality which all great church leaders have in common is spiritual receptivity. There is something in them that is open to heaven, something which urges them Godward. They have spiritual awareness and they go on to cultivate it until it becomes the biggest thing in their lives. They differ from the average person in that when they feel the inward longing, they do something about it. But to be spiritually receptive, as Samuel was in this story this morning, one of the things that we all need to do is to slow down and to make space. I don't know if you're like me, and sometimes you just feel as if your head is going to barrel right off the top of your shoulders because there are so many things going on in your head. Or like me, you've actually tripped occasionally because you've been walking so fast to get all these things done that are on your to-do list in a day that you actually trip up. Where are the oases? Where are the times in our Christian lives when we slow down and are open to connecting with God? That's what this story this morning is challenging us to take on board. Activity 
action, serving God in those kind of ways by good deeds and works is really important. But we can at times get so caught up in that that we forget why we're doing it and whom we're serving. And if we take on board A.W. Tozer's point that many of the truly great people who have served God down through history have been people who have been spiritually receptive, who have slowed down, who have cultivated time in their lives to listen, to be quiet, to wait, then the truth is that we will actually do better work and greater work when we are more dependent upon God. And that's the place that Samuel gets to in verse 10, where he uses this very famous phrase, speak for your servant is listening. What a thing to say, speak. What does God sound like? Does he sound like James Earl Jones or Morgan Freeman? Or maybe if you're of a certain generation, Charlton Heston. Is that what God's voice sounds like? Can we hear the voice of God? I think we can. Speak for your servant is listening. Servant implies humility, responsiveness, obedience, doing the will of God, hearing the will of God, and then doing the will of God. Speak for your servant is listening. Listening is something that goes beyond hearing. Listening is a deep and active engagement with the person who's speaking to you. I don't know, I'm going to confess something now, but there are times when somebody's saying something to me, and I might be hearing what they're saying, but I'm not really listening to what they're saying. Have you had that experience? Be honest with yourself. You probably have. Somebody's gabbing on about something, and you're kind of vaguely hearing what they're saying, but you're not actively listening. God is speaking all the time. Are we listening to what He's saying? So, how does God speak? How do we recognize God's voice? Well, there are four main ways in which God speaks. God speaks through creation. Look around you at the world in which we live. I was out yesterday morning for what was a lovely walk and what was turned out to be um, a beautiful day. The rain came on just after I finished my walk, so it was good timing. Um, over at Shatlow Row Park in Hamilton, I was out with my camera taking some photographs, and it was just, I had my headphones on, listening to um, a praise, some praise music, and it was just glorious and the sense of God's presence was tangible. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. So, you don't need to be in a church building, you can be out there in the world and have a sense of God's presence with you. God speaks through our conscience Romans chapter 2 verse 15 says, the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bear witness. We really shouldn't have to need laws that tell us what's right and wrong. Because inside you, you really know what's right and wrong. God has wired us up as people to know what's good and what's bad. There's an innate, natural response to things. God has given us a conscience that we might know Him and know His ways. And He's made it very clear, in particular, through His commands or through the Bible. People will sometimes say to me, you're always quoting the Bible, you're always saying how important it is to read the Bible. You know, it's an ancient book. What relevance does it have for our lives? Well, if that's our attitude to the Bible, we will never hear the voice of God. The other week when Keswick and Motherwell Great Bible Teaching Conference was here, 
there was a speaker from the Gideons, Gideons International, whom I guess many of you know, um, give away Bibles to hotels and hospitals and schools and so forth. And he told some amazing stories, some remarkable stories of people who had just rolled up at a hotel and the telly in the room wasn't working. And so they picked up a Bible that was placed there by the Gideons and they started to read it and their life was utterly transformed. The Bible, the commands of God, as a way of revealing God Himself. Deuteronomy chapter 4 says, Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. Keep His decrees and His commands, which I am giving you today, so that it may go well with you and your children after you, and that you may live long in the land the Lord your God gives you for all time. The Bible Contrary to what many people think about it as being a negative book, the Bible is a manual for life, for the abundant life that Jesus promised. But if God speaks to us through creation, through our inner being, our conscience, through His Word, His commands, the Scriptures, most of all, He speaks to us in Christ. And when we look at the life of of Jesus Christ, we see God come in the flesh. John chapter 1 verse 18 says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is Himself God, and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made Him known. If you want to know God, your Creator, then get to know His Son. Jesus Christ. I said at the top of this sermon, I think that the story of Samuel is a remarkable one. I do invite you to go away and read those first few chapters of 1 Samuel. If you're really enthusiastic, you might like to read on in the story and see the great prophet that he became, anointing many of the great kings of Israel, including David himself. I also said that this story gives us hope on just about every level. It gave hope to a woman who was barren and was able to bear a son. It gave hope to a nation that actually they didn't need to just follow in the wicked ways of Phineas and Hophni, the wicked, evil sons of Eli the priest. But it gives hope also that no matter where you are at in your life, whether you are elderly like Eli or whether you're very young like Samuel, whether you are mature and experienced in the ways of the world or whether you're wet behind the ears, there is a place for you in God's purposes. Just as in the story of Samuel, God promises to be with us all in every aspect of our lives from the cradle to the grave and indeed beyond into eternity. So I commend the beautiful story of the boy Samuel who grew to be a great servant of God because he said, speak for your servant is listening. Amen. And now let's sing in response to that a hymn that seems very appropriate indeed. I, the Lord of sea and sky, here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart.
now we'll bring our offerings for the work of God. The offering will be uplifted. It seems somehow appropriate that in the day that we're um, thinking about the story of Samuel, that Samuel should be one of those who helps his mum bring the offering up to the table. So there you go. Uh, the wonders of technology, folks. Um, there's a message from Graham uh, online saying, Good morning from Sydney, Australia. And hello to my gran, Annie Gillespie. Lovely, eh? Let's share together in a prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Almighty God, you see all things, and throughout history you have called people to respond to your challenge and to follow you. Today we thank you for those who have heard that call and in faith through the years have responded. Abraham called to venture into the unknown, trusting in your promise. 
Moses called to lead your people from slavery to the promised land against all odds. Joshua called to trust in you. Samuel called by you to a life of service even before he realized it was you calling. The prophets called to proclaim your word regardless of the cost to themselves. John the Baptist called to be a messenger in the wilderness preparing the way for Jesus Christ. The twelve disciples called to leave the security of their livelihoods to follow Jesus. The Apostle Paul called to preach the gospel to all nations. Almighty God, this morning, help us to hear your call, and in faith like those before us, to respond and do your will. We thank you for these and all in subsequent generations who have heard your voice, who have responded in faith, who have offered to you their service. We thank you for those that we've known whose discipleship has been an inspiration to us in previous generations, those who have been an example of what it is to live and to walk in faith. But above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for His perfect revealing of who you are, His total love, and His supreme sacrifice. We thank you for His willingness to take the way of the cross, despite the failure of His closest and most trusted friends. Help us to learn from the example of Christ and all those who have gone before us to respond faithfully and willingly, courageously to. Give us ears to hear whenever you call and faith to follow wherever you lead. As we bring you these offerings, take them Use them and us through the power of your Holy Spirit so that your will may be done and your kingdom come and your glory be made known. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is a really rousing one. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing.
Father God, lead us into the world, renewed in vigor, in hope, in faith, and in purpose. Send us back to live and to work for you, sharing your love and living your life, bringing glory to your name through Jesus Christ our Lord, this day and always.